Thanks, David. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm the warm-up act, so uh, the, uh, the keynote is f uh, following. Uh, so I just want to follow up very quickly on um, uh, on David's uh, notion of choreographing acts of embodiment and disembodiment, and uh, to reflect a little bit on this question of um, of embodiment together, because in a way, I mean, if one looks up the definition of embodiment, um, it's a it's very odd one. What find you know you find that it says you know it's the physical manifestation of an idea. Um, so when we think about that choreographing of embodiment and disembodiment, we're we're in fact talking about is about. Uh, bringing to reality some sort of notion of what we think architecture is, and certainly, you know, the call for new flavors is 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 this is this call. Now, part of what we're going to be talking about, I presume today, is the idea that buildings are not just form uh, unified on top of a lot line, but that it, they entail the production of materials and their dismemberment and what happens to them afterwards. And um, I want to just explore with you briefly what a radical challenge actually that is to the notion of architecture and how we might actually begin to have to really think very broadly about how we would engage in this rethinking of architecture that would entail its, its whole lifespan. There's a number of art, um, artists doing work on this, on this subject. Uh, Lara Almasarag Almarsegi, um, this is her project in 2004, which basically took the gallery where she was exhibiting her work, calculated um, all the materials that it took to build that gallery, uh, and then went ahead and purchased the exact same materials, and then exhibited them within the gallery. So in a way, you know, she is bringing us a, a visual of this, of this long process. The materials are disaggregated uh, in, inside the gallery, but then we can see and reflect on the labor it takes, the energy it takes, the, 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 uh, the effort it takes to assemble them into the building that then surrounds them. So we have in one image uh, the combination of these two um, these two ideas of architecture, one as a series of, of elements and the other one as, um, uh, as a series of, um, of constructed logics. And I want to contrast that with this image of the Parthenon atop uh, of the Acropolis because um, one of the crazy things about when you, if I'm sure many of you have uh, visited Athens and gone to see the, the Acropolis, is that this building is constantly changing. Uh, and when you go up there, you see it's an enormous construction site. And in fact, all the materials that are both historical and new are being aggregated and disaggregated around, around the building itself. And you can see on the left-hand side, that colonnade, which has, as you, can, as you can see, marble from the very same quarry that was originally used but that is now new and so you can see it's a little bit wider with the environmental um, acid rain and, and weathering, there's a little bit of iron in the marble so it just goes slightly red so over time it will become the same color as the, as the, rest, of the, uh, as the rest of the marble and, and the rest of the Parthenon. But what I'm, I, I wanna think about together is you know, just what is the body of a building? You know, what is the body of architecture? What is this body that you're trying to sort of help us rethink uh, and think about how it gets put together and falls apart? And maybe not, uh, maybe not falls apart, but how it gets taken apart. And what I would like to suggest is that it's really, it's really not that easy to take it apart. Because when you go up to the Parthenon and you go to see it, um, you, you, you say, oh, fantastic, here I am, I'm, yeah, I'm finally made it to see the Parthenon. And then they say, well, you know, actually most of it is, is, a, um, is a little bit of a replica. And so part of it, we originally moved to the building that was here, uh, this building, which is the Parthenon, the first Parthenon Museum, to protect it from the environment because there's a lot of, you know, pollution in, in, uh, in, in Athens. But now we moved it down to... Um, 
to uh, a building just down, just down the, the, uh, the hill, um, the really special pieces of the Parthenon, the really important pieces, we moved them down to the Athens, uh, to the Acropolis Museum in Athens, which is designed, as you know, by uh, our very own Bernard Schumi. So already you get there trying to see the, 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 the building, the sort of origin of classicism for many of us, uh, and parts of it are not there. And so you go down the hill and you see this, and sort of part of the building is reconstructed, the, the size of the building is reconstructed there. But of course, uh, these are the original pieces, and these, when you get there, you're told, um, actually, we don't have those. Uh, some of the building is actually in London. So if you really want to see the Parthenon, then you have to go travel to London. And, uh, and of course, they've been there uh, since 1811, but about 1817, 1819, they were already installed at, at the British Museum. And what I'm very interested in is this group of people also that is around there, you know, that, because one of the things I want us to sort of think about together is that an idea, an idea about architecture is always shared. In other words, that part of what the, the challenge of embodied energy is to convince other people that this definition of architecture, this definition of architecture as an, uh, an idea about embodiment of, of a certain kind of energy is actually real. And presumably this is finding some sort of resistance. And I think that part of the job here is to identify what that resistance might be. And I would say that it's possibly culture. And um, so, but let me just sort of telegraph that and think about a little bit, you know, then what has happened to this. Um, you know, so here, is, here, here it is now. There have been all sorts of polemics about the, how the Parthenon was installed and how it should be installed. And so here it was reconstructed so that um, this uh, uh, frieze could be understood as a bas relief that tells a story and you could walk around that hall and, and, um, and really um, sort of follow, follow the narrative of, uh, that's in it. And I won't get too much into that. But, what I think is interesting for me is the idea that, okay, so you want to see the Parthenon and it's everywhere. It's not in one place. And yet somehow in our mind, we still think of the Parthenon as having a body, as existing fully together. In other words, the, uh, there, there are pieces of the Parthenon sort of everywhere. And every one of them claims somehow to get us a little bit closer to, to, to that body. So it's something very odd because, in fact, what you, what you really um, have here is the idea of a body that's not a body or the body that's outside of itself or, or that, does, that has no inside or no outside. It's this very strange sort of idea about architecture which confounds our notions of architecture as having some sort of form, some sort of inside, some sort of outside. Um, and yet we can sort of see the Parthenon as, having, uh, as holding together. Now, that, that holding together, in other words, materially, the Parthenon is everywhere, but somehow in our minds it holds together. It, it bears some sort of reality. It still has a sort of energy that, that draws it back. And so what, what is that energy? So this is what is interesting. It's something that we never really challenge. Right? We never really challenge, I mean, now, you, it's recently the Greeks have been saying, you know, we want some of that Parthenon back, but they're really focused on the British, you know, they're, they're not so worried about all the other little pieces, the other pieces are not that important. So it's really not so much about bringing the whole thing together, and they're certainly not going to take the, the, the Parthenon that's down the hill and put it back on top of the hill. So it's really about a different idea, right? They're not really questioning the idea that, that this is a dismembered, sort of fallen apart, uh, object, fallen apart body. So I'm very interested in the fact that we don't question this idea. I'm very interested in the fact that this is a realm of experience that we've somehow protect. Um, some of us call this realm of experience preservation, um, but it's a very interesting realm of experience where we allow ourselves this opportunity to think of things that would otherwise qualify us as completely crazy. You know, because if you say to somebody, uh, my body is outside and inside, uh, you would say, what are you talking about? Uh, you are absolutely insane, right? So, um, and yet, actually, that's how we all grow up. We all start out 
not knowing where our body is. We, we all grow up as infants trying to figure out where the inside and the outside is. Uh, we don't know. In fact, um, and when you look at uh, psychoanalysis, child psychoanalysis, that is one of the things that is most striking about human development is that we develop ways to try to figure this out. And fantasy is one of those ways in which we begin to figure out reality. And fantasy starts out of frustration because all of us are born with this idea of omnipotence. When we cry, we need something, we're all really needy on our mothers, right? We can't feed ourselves when we're born. And when we cry, our mother feeds us. But we don't experience that as mommy's doing a good job, she's a fantastic mother. We experience that as omnipotence. We experience that as I need food, the food appeared, therefore I am you know, creating the food that is, that is that is uh, going into my body. My desire is satisfied immediately because I am very strong. I'm very powerful, right? Um, now, we can, of course, a child's not thinking in those terms, but just as a way to sort of translate. But of course, what ends up happening is that the mother sometimes is a little late to the feeding, or you know, we uh, are frustrated in different ways. And, and that frustration then leads us to, uh, very often, find ways of shifting that to other things and we shift it to things like a teddy bear or a blanket or you know, I don't know how many of you remember these blankets some people keep them for a very long time we were just talking about this earlier on um, what is important about those blankets is that the parents play into the madness of the child you know the, 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 the child says this thing is vitally important to me it's as vitally important to me as food I cannot live without this blanket I will not leave the house unless you find the blanket. And they'll cry and yell. Now, as a parent, you can say, you know, live with it, kid. That blanket is not important. You're going to survive. Let's get out of the house. Or you can say, stop everything. We will be late to the birthday party. Let's find the blanket. OK? And so that idea of you finding the blanket is a way of playing into the madness of the child. And it's a way of telling the child, yes, that object is real. In fact, what's happening there, as Winnicott teaches us, is you're teaching your child a lesson that you're not, you don't know you're teaching. And the child is asking a question that they cannot ask. The question is, what the hell's reality? They don't know where inside and outside is, right? They don't know what is vitally important to the inside of their body and, and what is not. And so this area of experience that cannot be challenged because you cannot really take a, begin to have an epistemological discussion with a child about what is real and what is not, happens in, in a, 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 the, the formation of subjectivity, understanding of what is inside, what is outside. It gets worked out in a way that neither the teacher nor the student, so to speak, if we're in academic realities here, are, uh, know how to ask the question and formulate it. And so that realm of experience is what uh, I think we need to begin to think about here. Winnicott says, we never stop in life uh, doing this. We never stop as adults trying to figure out what's inside and outside. Some of us can't figure it out. Uh, some of us can. But we never figure it out alone. It's a social reality. We tell each other what is real and what is not. The parents function as the social reality for the child. We here function for each other's uh, social reality. So um, that is, I think, what, what needs to be worked out, is what is real. And we need to work it out socially. So I like to think of, um, of these kinds of things called uh, buildings um, as not me creations. Uh, not me creations meaning that we don't omnipotently make them. Um, we don't uh, fabricate architecture. We, in fact, impose some sort of idea. We think of it as, uh, as, uh, as architecture that we've created, just like the child thinks of, of the teddy bear as something that they've created. But in fact, what we're doing is we're asking a question about what is real. And that question cannot really be answered by society. It has to be figured out in the way that society responds or doesn't respond to that, to that object. In other words, whether society says, oh yeah, yeah, that's architecture, or oh no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not architecture. So what is important about, the, about this is that there is, 
in a way, a continuity of experience. Now, all the building blocks that have been replaced in the, in, in the uh, Parthenon have been labeled very carefully. Everything has been marked so that we know exactly what has been put in, what has been removed. We can trace everything. The cleaning of the Parthenon is the subject of enormous controversy. When it was cleaned, when these pieces in London were cleaned, uh, these were cleaned, these were not yet cleaned because of all the pollution inside of the museum, this caused a stir across the world that we were, we were, we were killing the Parthenon by, by cleaning the, the, the dust off of it. Now, if you know, you know, these not me creations, part of what is important about them is that they provide this continuity of experience between inside and outside, between those things we don't know. So children, for example, get very upset when you clean their blanket, when it doesn't smell the same way that it smelled the day before, where, where you know, there has to, that continuity of experience is extraordinarily important. We very rarely ask about the continuity of cultural experience. And in fact, as adults, part of what we try to figure out inside and outside and what's real and what's not is through culture. So when we talk about embodied energy, I think we need to talk about culture, but we need to talk about culture in the way that culture is uh, formulated through objects, through the way that objects provide a type of continuity of experience for us across not only space, but across time. So when we think about uh, choreographing acts of embodiment and disembodiment, uh, we have to think of those, I think, in the context of a cultural reality, in the context of a world that is going to be telling us back that they either get the embodiment and the disembodiment as belonging to a same process or that they don't get it, that they see it as part of the same continuity or that they don't. This is again the, the cleaning of uh, the, the, um, the pieces of the Parthenon that were in Athens and a lot of attention was made to how exactly they were cleaned so as to preserve the continuity of that patina and that experience. And so with that, um, I would say that part of what we have to, part of the function of a not me creation is to gently frustrate this illusion that inside and outside can be played with, that we can have this sort of uh, unchallenged realm of experience. Part of the teddy bear's function is to allow the weaning off from the parents, right? To, to, to make that possible in a way that's tolerable for us. And so I think that part of what the challenge of this conference today is to begin to frustrate the idea that architecture is, is coherent form in a way that's tolerable for the rest of us. And how you're going to do that, I think, is, is, is going to be the real challenge. But I would say that um, we can take some lessons from preservation and the importance of the continuity of the experience of those pieces and how they come together somehow as an idea. Because the Parthenon uh, is not just a series of stones strewn about the world. It is, it is a concept. And so the concept of embodied energy, I think, is a very powerful one. Uh, but it, in my view, needs to think of energy uh, as, as cultural energy, too, not, not simply uh, joules and, and, and so on. So thank you very much for your attention.